Welcome back to One on One, New York's longest running sports call-in show. I'm Caleb Stein, and we have the pleasure of hearing from sports marketer, businessman, speaker, founder of the Steiner Agency, Steiner Sports Collectible Exchange, specializing in sports memorabilia and high-value sports collectibles. He has been in the business for over 35 years, raised in Brooklyn. It is an honor to introduce Mr. Brandon Steiner to the show. Thanks for coming on, sir. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be on the show with you. And I'm, I'm, what I'm excited about is that like 10 years from now, I'm going to be able to say that I did this interview with you when you're doing all kinds of great things. And I just get that feeling about you that probably something amazing is going to happen. And I'm going to be bragging how I was able to do this interview with you. Like it was kind of like if I did an interview with Bob Costas when he was in college kind of thing, you know, it's kind of that same kind of vibe. I, I love that. I mean, I've, I've had the luck of doing some stuff with some really young, 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 really great talent. And just watching them grow is amazing. Something tells me about you that you're going to be doing some big things. My goal is to get the, whoever's listening to this, I'm going to get more people to listen. There's no question. I'm sending this. When you send me this tape, I'm sending it out. We're going to blow, uh, we're going to blow the ratings through the door here. And, and, and you're going to have one of the highest rating pods of all time. But anyway, what's going on at Fordham and, uh, what can we what can we share today that maybe will help some of the people that are listening? Yeah, so I had a question about how we've seen sports fans mark special moments throughout history, right? With the development of social media, you got the Instagram post now. You got the cameo. You got athletes filming, you know, hey, Johnny, it's your eighth birthday. This is Manny Ramirez saying hello. How has that changed and affected the physical sports memorabilia industry that you've known so well throughout this change? Well, believe it or not, the athletes hate cameo. They hate what they 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 they're all about the money, but they're not imposters. Like they don't like make them believe they're doing a video like they love you and know you, and when they don't know you, they don't like that. Right. They're happy to share the memories and happy to share the the exciting moments that have happened, which is where memorabilia comes in, uh, and 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 other things like that. But I think I think you know I think it's more social media that really just makes it all pop. It's now a big deal to whether you get a picture with an athlete or a celebrity or whether you get an Instagram post that then a celebrity goes on and likes it or comments. Like that's the big get. Because that's like more real. The cameo thing was was good for a while, but you know, even to Generation Z, which, you know, there's there's a little bit of a question about how you know what they what they'll buy into. You know, we all have generations, we all buy into certain things. So, you know. Go send me some kind of message from somebody famous, like, you know, they'll go print that up and put it up on the wall and everything else. But I think I think that's the big get is the photo with a celebrity is really the big get. Because that meant you met that person and you had some kind of interaction. And then there's some collectability around that. I, I think the NFT was a big flop, but it's I think it may still have legs to come back because the digital experience, but to, to give you an example, like, and there's so many of them, like when Aaron Judge hits his home run or some big game that something crazy happens, and this happens all the time, you really don't have anything to commemorate it. Like, you know what I mean? There's no more ticket. And that's where there's a digital experience that I want. I want to be able to show you that I was at that perfect game, that I was at game seven. Let me show you this little video com com confirming that my ticket, that I had it. Because everybody says they're at a game, but there's way too many people saying they're at these games that would fit into the arena. But uh, so I, I think we're missing something with the ticket stub leaving. Something digitally needs to be created. And then you have the option to go by the physical part. Like if I was at the Aaron Judge game, you know, where he hits the 60, 62 home runs, I want that digital confirmation with a video of hitting the home run and, and blah, blah, blah. And then maybe some scan of the, uh, the people that are in the game. But I also want to be able for 25 bucks buy the physical ticket. Like somebody, an artist needs to go make a physical ticket for great games, and it only is accessible to the people that bought a ticket if you have proof that you went to the game. Like, that's interesting to me. Give me the combination of the digital and the physical. So I'd like to see that happen. Um, and I don't think it's that hard. I, I think what I just said is very doable. How have you seen the client demographics of sports memorabilia collection change over the course of your career? If I, think it's a great, I think it's a great question. It's the thing that excites me the most. And there's two things that have happened. One, when I was at the National in Chicago, which I, I, I you know, it's a lot, it's a lot of work when I go to those kind of events because it's kind of like, uh, 
you know, it's Derek Jeter walking around Yankee Stadium. It's not something he looks forward to doing. Like, I'm not that big a deal, but in my little world of collectability, I'm a big deal, let's say. Mm -hmm. So when I go to the National Collectors Convention, it's a tremendous amount of work because everybody there has bought my stuff and they know who you are. So you don't know what you're going to get hit with. And you, you, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a little burdensome when you have everybody's eyeballs on you. But what I saw this year at the Chicago show is, number one, is the entire show increased by a third, which is amazing. So you're talking about a show that's like 200 uh, and something thousand square feet that went up to 400,000 square feet from 250. That was very promising. And then the second thing I saw was a tremendous amount of young kids. And I mean kids. We're talking teenagers as young as 14, 15, 16 years old with booths and with suitcases. I mean, they were just everywhere, spending money, wheeling, dealing. So they were into the collectible thing, which is always nerve wracking for an older guy like me is saying, is this young audience going to buy in to collectability? Like, listen, a lot of you know, stamps used to be a big deal when I was a kid. It's not a big deal now. It's like, you know, there's a lot of things that coins, you know, it's a big deal. It's not a big deal now. So like, you know, every generation has a choice where they want to opt in to some of the things that are being collected, right? Albums was a big deal when I was a kid. It wasn't a big deal, and now all of a sudden it became a big deal again. So things mm -hmm. kind of come and go. And then the second thing is, what's amazing, and this is probably even more important than the first, is that women. First of all, at this show, there were so many women, but if you go to a sporting event now, I mean, it's almost 50-50. And the women are not there because they, they were their boyfriends. The women are there. They know more about sports than the guys do. They're very heavily invested. They're knowledgeable. They're wearing all the gear. They're 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 just so like everything. Women are just always superior to men, and 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 they're now superior to men. Even in the one thing that we kind of had to ourselves is no longer a guy's thing. The big game is not a guy's thing. And I see so many couples, even older couples and women. And what I what's promising about that besides the obvious is that we all know who the spenders are and the women are the spenders. They're always going to outspend the men. And the fact that they're now engaged in sports, as far as buying tickets, buying memorabilia, buying apparel is, is a good thing. It's a, it's a very, very good thing. And the fact that the young generation is, is all in that now a lot of it was trading of cards and then it was memorabilia too, but cards, the fact that the young ones are so into the trading card business, they've completely taken that business and blown it up almost three or four times. So I always say, you know, the first thing when you're a kid that you collect is probably the thing you're going to probably collect throughout your life. I always say my goal is just to get a card or a signed baseball in a, in a 10 year old's hands. Mm -hmm. That was my goal uh, for many, many years at my old company, Stein. That's all I wanted to do. Just get a collectible in a kid's hand. Cause I know that once you have one, you're going to want two, you want 10. And it's very true. And uh, I opened up at one time about 10 ice cream stores always geared towards you know, the nine, 10, 11 year old, and it served me extremely well. Uh, now those kids are 25, 30 and they're huge fans of mine. What do you think makes sports collectibles specifically appeal to people? You kind of touched on it a little bit as opposed to say pop culture memorabilia or stuff like that. I think the pop culture memorabilia is extremely hot now too. I think, I think collecting on all levels is hot, pop, political, People are more guitars are incredibly hot and, and musicals, anything you get from music, just that the musicians, particularly rock musicians, they're just not participating in the category, which is very frustrating because if they did, it would be huge. You know, Taylor Swift can go sign like 100,000 autographs right now at a crazy price and would sell in a heartbeat. And she's like not even working on the licensing part of our business really that much, as much as she could. But the collectible thing is just intriguing because it's it's the gambling part. It's like, is this going to get hot? Like, if I buy, a, you know, if I buy a, the San Francisco quarterback rookie card, if you're smart enough to do that, right? The last pick in the draft, the whole thing. But if you were smart enough to buy a bunch of his rookie cards, which probably would have cost you 50 cents, and those cards are selling for several hundred. And that action is, is cool. You know, I bought uh, at one point in the 90s when Shaq was a rookie. My wife said, you're crazy. I, I went out and bought, I think it was over a thousand Shaq rookie cards. And at that point already, they were about seven, like six, seven bucks. I was like, you know, it's an upper deck trading card. So I had to take the card, you send it into upper deck, and then you get the card that you, the exact rookie card. So I had a thousand of those. I was into the thing for about $6,000. Now listen, I mean, granted, I mean, it's still the card is uh, a 30 or $40 card. If you get a really high grade, it could be a couple hundred. And I had them sign a bunch of them. Get a few hundred dollars on that. 
So I've made my money back and then some, I'm still sitting with a few hundred of them. So it's that action, man. You know, it's like, and I, I think that's a lot of what's driving the trading card business that you think you're going to get that one card that's going to be worth God knows what. Uh, on the collectible end, you know, you got to be a little more savvy now. The price is a little higher. Players want a little more. They're being a little care more careful with their game use. So you got to know what you're doing to play in that arena. But, oh, you know, the people that do have some money are playing in it and doing really well. Because anybody who's bought anything in the last five, six years in that arena, it's, most of the stuff has gone up. And uh, it's been a good good run for them. Uh, it doesn't mean it's going to stay up, but it's gone up and it's done pretty well, particularly the game used. So when it comes to entering the the industry of memorabilia, is the reason you went into sports memorabilia specifically as simple as you love sports or was there a sort of different business angle that you that you had? Well, that's another very interesting question. Unfortunately, I'm not going to give you the answer you want to hear, but what the hell, right? But, you know, at the end of the day, when I started my business, really, I was a marketer and I was marketing athletes. And it was very difficult because in those days, in the late 80s, a little before you were born in the early 90s, it was, you know, you weren't getting a lot of money for an appearance, even the bigger names. The, the real money that came to athletes didn't happen until later in the 90s. So I'm doing literally hundreds and thousands of appearances, if you can imagine, and not making a lot of money. And I was beginning to wonder if this was going to work out for me. So I started trying to find some other funnels of revenue. And at the time, I was taking a train into work. It's a true story. And I, I couldn't stand the train. You know, I grew up on the subway in Brooklyn. I, I don't want to take the train to work every day. And Metro North, like you miss the train, it's like a 40-minute wait. At least in Brooklyn, on the subway, there's another train coming five minutes later. I didn't have the balls to go to my wife and say, I want to buy a car. I wasn't even doing that well yet. You know, it's like, and then, so the, the what happened was is, is, I started the memorabilia business because I was trying to get off the train so I could buy a car. There's no love or anything like that for collectibles. I was always a sports fan. I played a lot of sports, but I had no idea there was ever going to be a sports business. Growing up, there was no such thing. There's no such thing as a sports business. Like there was, you know, a couple of people that were agents, which are mostly lawyers and the teams. There's not a lot of marketing going on, not a lot of anything, maybe a little bit in golf. So I'm on the train and, I'm, and I'm, I'm fully committed. And I always say, it doesn't matter where you're at. It only matters what you want to accept. It's probably one of my favorite lines, and it's true. It doesn't matter where you're at. Once, you not, once you're into a high level of non-acceptance and you're, you get committed to doing what it is you don't want to do anymore. And I'm thinking, I got to get off this train. And I see on the back page of the newspaper a picture of Mark Messier holding the Stanley Cup. It was 1994. And I'm like, I think I could sell 15,000 of those. That's how many people sit in Madison Square Garden. And the Rangers winning the Cup in 94 was a huge, huge deal. So I chased Mark Messier down, signed him up, and, and it was it was ended up being a home run, one of my better contracts, one of my better relationships. And that's why I started Steiner Memorabilia at the time. And then I went and bought my first car. So, you know, when you really want something, you're not willing to accept something, you'd be surprised how far you can go. You know, when you think about how hard it was to get in the Fordham and you really wanted to get in there, yeah. you start calling relatives, you start calling friends, you start seeing who knows who, uh, you're right. I mean, yeah. it's amazing how far you go when you want something. You know what I mean? It's amazing how lazy you get when you're really not that fully committed. And uh, so I always say, you know, people that are listening, like if there's, you know, if you want to know what your level of commitment is, look at your level of non-acceptance. Because if you're not willing to accept something, whether it be a relationship or a situation you're in, if you turn up the volume on your not acceptance, the commitment will follow, and then you'll find you'll be able to find your way to getting what you want. Absolutely, yeah. That's we got words of wisdom here on one on one. We got sports talk. We got words of wisdom. Finally, last one. You can one, take that to your social media. Put that in the bank. I gotta tell you because that's right. That's right. It's every bit of the millions of dollars that I've made comes from that story. I, I mean, I can tell you fifty stories that match up to that one of levels of not acceptance, which enables me to get what I want, which I've made a ton of money on. So that just put that in the bank. It's it's a gold nugget. Absolutely. You've been softly credited as being the inventor of the everything bagel. You knew that one was coming, man. Well, not softly. There's no soft about that. I don't it's know where it's you get all hard. It's softly. all hard. Don't, don't tiptoe around me, son. Like, hey. All right. Now, I invented the goddamn everything bagel. Okay? Let's make no mistake. Okay? Here's my everything bagels right here. Okay? Let's not be confused. Okay, everything bagel. There it is. These are not real, but you know, you get to just. I invented the everything bagel way before Seth Godin and everybody else. Although you probably watched the Gary Vee thing where he went crazy when I told him this, but it, it's really not that. It's I don't want to get to too long a story about it, but generally speaking, 
I was trying to build out my paper route and I was about, I think at the time I was 12. And the only way, I, nobody would get the paper. I was trying to open up these accounts because if I opened up a lot of accounts, I would have won a box of candy bars. So I was very driven and I, it wasn't happening. So finally I ran into this woman. I said, look, if I deliver may, bagels and milk, would you get the paper delivered? So I, at some point I had 29 dailies and 34 Sundays. I went up to 199 dailies and 200 and something Sundays. It was crazy. But I was delivering more milk and bagels you could imagine. I mean, with two shopping carts to deliver all the bills, bagels, the papers. And I was rock and rolling. So the bagel guy, now back when you know, we're talking about, we are talking about over 50 years ago. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. But 50 years ago, there weren't a lot of bagel places. And if you got a bagel, it came from a few bagel stores that were around and they would bake all morning and then deliver the bagels to the supermarkets and grocery stores. Now you see bagel stores everywhere, but that was not the case back in the early 70s. So I'm going to the store. I'm buying all these bagels every morning and milk. And the guy says, man, you're a hardworking kid. Would you want to come in and help me make bagels? I said, yeah, sure. I'm going to show you how to make them, bake them. And it was a big deal. And the reason it was a big deal, there was such a, re a recession in the 70s. It was very hard as a teenager. Like right now, if you wanted to find work, if you're 15, 16, you can find work in a heartbeat. You know, but back then, there was no jobs. I mean, adults were washing dishes. It was a bad recession. If you go back and look in the early 70s, it was a bad three or four year recession. I never dealt with that as a kid because I knew how to bake and make bagels. And what happened is soon after I learned how to do this, a whole bunch of bagel places started opening up everywhere. Bagel knots, a chain. And I always had jobs all through high school and even college when I wanted it. But anyway, I go in there one morning. I'm going there every morning starting at 4 a.m. to bake bagels. And at 7.30, I would leave to go deliver my papers. And, you know, 13 years old, 12 years old. It's like really way too early for me to be waking up. So I go in there to quit. And he goes, no, no, no I don't want you to quit. I'm going to give you a promotion. I'm going to give you a raise. I'm going to give you a dollar fifteen an hour. You're going to be my night baker. You're a hard worker. I just need you to come in. And as people come in, you bake a couple dozen here, a couple dozen there. And as I'm baking, I'm bored because I'm used to baking hundreds of bagels a minute when we were baking for all the route. It was this big factory. So we were baking thousands of bagels in the morning. Now I'm baking a, you know, 50 bagels here, 25 bagels there. It was like nothing, like more. So I start putting all these different ingredients on the bagels. Bagel twist, I'm squishing the bagels down and sprinkling oil. Yeah, I mean, every combination you can think of salt and poppy, onion and whatever. And then one night I have all these seeds that I, from all the things I had tried and it was all the seeds, which is everything. And I put them on the bagels. I'm like, this is unbelievable. This tastes great. And that's how we got the everything bagel. That's it, folks. You heard it here live, pre-recorded on one-on-one. -on -one. Mr. Steiner, thanks so much for joining us. We'll be right back with more one-on-one -on -one after these messages.